Dr. Janil Puticherry. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Singh says that the recommendations by the Committee of Privileges rests on only, only one fact, only one pillar. But the reality is that in examining the evidence provided by him and his Workers' Party colleagues, MPs, CADA members, as, and, and the back and forth, the, the committee came to conclusions on the basis of questions that they had, gaps in the logic, omissions in the submissions and the documents. The questions, gaps and omissions that he began his statement with are still present. Um, and they are questions, gaps and omissions about what happened within the Workers' Party. What was the truth of the matter between him, his colleagues and Ms. Raisa Khan? He talks about political partisanship, and unfortunately, the conclusion of the proceedings of the Committee of Privileges lead a reasonable reader to come to the conclusion that it is him and his colleagues who engaged in political partisanship by choosing to obfuscate the matter and to deal with Ms. Raisa Khan in the way that they did. He asks, why was the C Committee of Privileges not interested in getting to the bottom of why Ms. Raisa Khan lied? But actually, the reality is they did. And she herself gave a clear explanation. He and his colleagues doubt that explanation, and he has tried to justify why I understand. He asserts his innocence, but he has not yet filled in the, the gaps and the omissions, nor has he answered the questions. These questions on the facts do go to the very heart of the matter as to whether or not Mr. Singh has been honest in his dealings, including with Ms. Khan. On the 8th of August, Ms. Khan went to Mr. Singh, Mr. Faisal and Ms. Lim, confessed to speaking untruth in Parliament, and on their own evidence, not a word was spoken about how and when Ms. Khan would tell the truth. In fact, Mr. Faisal says zero discussions were had, no question, no comment, despite an extensive discussion about a completely separate matter. Mr. Singh has not explained how this is possible or even half credible. Why is it that they were able to discuss the clarificatory statement on FGC and polygamy, but felt unable to make a single comment on a far bigger issue, a lie told in Parliament? Is this credible that this could have happened? And as to their concern about her mental state, why was there not a single word spoken between them? Not a single contemporaneous exchange of email messages? What did they discuss amongst themselves? What did they decide to do or, or not to do? More importantly, why was there not a single step taken to prepare Ms. Khan to tell the truth? It's by their own admission that in the almost two months that followed the meeting on the 8th of August, there was no discussion, no one spoke to each other. Neither Mr. Faisal nor Ms. Lim asked Mr. Singh what he was doing to ensure that the truth will come out. Did Mr. Singh check with Ms. Khan or her parents as to whether they had become aware of the sexual assault? As Mr. Singh has explained, he had perhaps given a bit too much time, but he stated it as a precondition, his foremost concern, but he did not once ask about this. And the Workers' Party CEC was also not aware, neither were the party members or CARDIS. In short, not a single step taken all the way from August until the 3rd of October remotely could be construed as preparing Ms. Khan to come clean and tell the truth. Why? We still don't know. That's an omission, a gap, a question. But looking at all the rest of the statements, the evidence that's produced, isn't it consistent with Ms. Khan's account which is that if the matter didn't come up, she would not help to tell the truth. Then the truth could remain buried. Mr. Singh should explain clearly 
why no steps were taken if indeed it was important and it remains important for Workers' Party MPs to come clean, to tell the truth, to clarify an untruth told in Parliament, as he claims. On the 3rd of October, Mr. Singh went to see Ms. Khan. He didn't tell Mr. Faisal or Ms. Lim about this meeting. And he says that he made it clear that Ms. Khan should tell the truth. But he also admits at the same time that he did not say to her that he, she should tell the truth. Only four words were necessary. Five words. Raisa, tell the truth, please. Five words. Why didn't he say that? Why not instead say another five words? I will not judge you. Not judging someone is only relevant if Ms. Khan was to continue the lie. There was nothing to judge if she was going to be truthful. And if, she had been, if he had been so clear with Ms. Khan, why is it then on the 4th of October, when Minister Shanmugam raised the matter, Ms. Khan texted Mr. Singh, what should I do, Pratap? So she continued with what she was told to do, continue with the narrative, continue with the lie. But Mr. Singh's conduct tells us something as well. If he had been clear with Ms. Khan to clarify the lie, why did he not respond to Ms. Khan on that day and say it had already been made clear? Tell the truth. There's no two ways about it. Why not insist that she stand up, correct the untruth that she had just repeated? Why not do this when she had just repeated the lie in front of him and the entire parliament? And later, when they met, what did she say, Ms. Khan? Mr. Singh himself said that the first words to him were, perhaps that's another way, that is to tell the truth. Which, to a reasonable person, sounds very clear that Mr. Ms. Khan was suggesting to Mr. Singh a different path away from telling a lie. And then again, why not, at that point, make it clear that she needed to come back to Parliament now and clarify. One untruth is a problem. The second time, worse. And why not at that point ensure that the second lie in Parliament, the one which he, Ms. Lim and Ms. Faisal was, were aware of to be a lie, be clarified immediately. The Workers' Party stands for honesty, integrity, accountability. Where was all of that when Mr. Singh was privy to a lie being told again in Parliament? And for all the excuses given about making sure that her father was aware, did Mr. Singh ask Ms. Khan whether her father was aware already. He, he says no, but why not? He, it was so important, but he, 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 it was so important, it was the only reason he offers for Ms. Khan not having to come clean earlier. Yet, at the critical moment, he doesn't bother to ask, he doesn't get the details. On top of this, the Committee of Privileges heard from Ms. Lo Pei Ying and Mr. Nathan. They both spoke to Mr. Singh independently on the 12th of October, when he gave an account of what he had discussed with Ms. Khan on the 3rd of October. Both came away with a clear consensus that he had given Ms. Khan an option, a choice. It was for her to decide, completely contrary to what Mr. Singh had said at the Committee of Privileges. This is further supported by Ms. Lim's own contemporaneous written notes of the 29th of November disciplinary panel meeting with Ms. Khan. Mr. Singh himself had described what he had said to Ms. Khan on the 3rd of October as, it was your call. And Mr. Singh accepts that she, Ms. Lim, was accurate in her recording. This makes it quite clear. Mr. Singh was recounting his own conversation with Ms. Khan on the 3rd of October and said, it was your call. Again, an, an omission, a, a question left unanswered, which runs up against Mr. Singh's self-professed understanding that Ms. Khan was left with no doubt on the 3rd of October that she would have to come and tell the truth the next day. 7th of October, the police sent an email to ask Ms. Khan for an interview. Ms. Khan ignored it after counseling with Mr. Singh, Ms. Lim, and Mr. Faisal. Why not advise her to come clean if that was so important to them? If it had been the intention all along for Ms. Khan to come clean, explain herself, clarify the lie, and then why not cooperate with the police when they ask, what is there to hide if you're interested in integrity, honesty, and accountability? And further, Ms. Khan then writes to Mr. Singh and the others and says, thank you for guiding me through this without judgment. And according to the various testimonies, as of the 7th of October, exactly what guidance had been given. The only guidance that we are clear on her testimony was for her to continue with the narrative and not judge her. She had repeated the lie three days earlier. 
And it underscores the idea that Mr. Singh meant on 3rd October when he assured her he would not judge her. Follow the guidance, continue with the lie, there'll be no judgment. It was Mr. Singh's own evidence that on the 12th of October was the first time that Ms. Khan had, was told that she should come to Parliament and tell the truth. That is the first time that this was expressed, for Ms. Khan to come and tell the truth here in this House to Parliament. And at no time prior to this did Mr. Singh tell Ms. Khan that she should go and tell the truth, including when he had heard her double down on the lie on the 4th of October. Why? Members will also remember that Mr. Singh changed his evidence before the COP on this key point several times. He first said that Ms. Khan was to come clean and raise it on her own accord, regardless of whether it was brought up or not. If that is the case, then he must have known on the 3rd of October that it will come up one way or another on the 4th of October, which means some preparation would have to be done prior to the 4th of October. But when it was pointed out to him that not a single step in preparation was done, he then changed his evidence. He then said she would bring it up and clarify only if she was asked. What is the truth? There is still a gap, an omission, and a question that Mr. Singh has not provided an answer to. The reality is that none of these questions, which go to the heart of the issue, have been addressed. These are important because they tell us whether Mr. Singh has been honest or not in his evidence to the Committee of Privileges. These also tell us what kind of conduct that these also tell us the kind of conduct that Mr. Singh is prepared to engage in in order to keep a lie hidden and keep a lie a lie. Mr. Singh should come out clearly and tell Parliament. What is his response to the specific findings in the Committee of Privileges? What is his explanation? for the various inconsistencies that have occurred on the facts based on his own accord? What is his explanation for the complete and deafening silence about an absence of steps whatsoever that could have been seen as consistent with wanting the lie to be clarified? For months. Why is there nothing between him, Ms. Slim, and Mr. Faisal? Why is there no contemporaneous communication between them? between me and my colleagues, just to settle what time we should meet uh, in order to go through our parliamentary questions, we would exchange various pages of emails. Uh, but this, for most important matter, nothing. Deafening silence. If it is so, it is hard to believe. What about the disciplinary panel, which was set up to look into Ms. Khan's conduct? Why not disclose to the Workers' Party CEC their own members and their own cadres, that in fact Ms. Khan had already admitted come clean to three of the senior Workers' Party leaders, that they had discussed it with her, given her guidance, and also disclosed that Mr. Singh met with Ms. Khan on the 3rd of October. If indeed he had told her to tell the truth, would that not be relevant to the proceedings of the disciplinary panel? Would that not mean that Ms. Khan had gone against and disobeyed Mr. Singh's advice and instructions? You look at it, as a reasonable person, one conclusion, that Mr. Singh's account of the facts did not happen, which is why Mr. Singh was eager to suppress this highly relevant and critical bit of information. The involvement of all three disciplinary panel members and their knowledge from August about the lie. Still, a gap, an omission, and a question unexplained. Not explaining questions, not answering questions was something that Mr. Faisal Manap also did. He refused to answer questions put to him by the select committee. He asked for this to be recorded. Quite extraordinary. I, I was quite struck by how extraordinary this behavior was when I was watching it. He must have understood the severe consequences. Watching the video, reading the transcripts, the conclusion I came to at the time is that he knew that saying anything at all would be damaging to Mr. Singh and Ms. Lim. He could have lied to protect them, but he chose to remain silent, understanding the consequences. Because, because lying under oath or affirmation, lying to a select committee, is a serious matter. It needs to be dealt with properly. People I've spoken to about the COP, my residents, have not always followed the intricate details of the allegations and the testimony. But when I asked them the question, did Mr. Pratam Singh lie? The response is usually one of 
Maybe, possibly, probably, or I don't know. Most reasonable people admit a serious possibility that he might have lied. And the COP, the Committee of Privileges, has come to the conclusion that he did indeed lie, a serious transgression that ordinarily would require an investigation leading either to exoneration or prosecution. Ordinarily, because that's the standard of the law that should apply to all of us. Mr. Singh and the members of the WP have made many speeches, rhetorical flourishes about accountability and transparency. They put across the idea that these are high principles that they believe in. But a key test of one's principles is whether you apply them to yourself for a greater good. Because action speaks volumes, much more than high soaring rhetoric. And there's no sign of that action in the details that the Committee of Privileges has recorded about what happened within the WP away from the public spotlight, their communications, the conduct of the disciplinary panel, the statements by Mr. Singh, their actions and their inactions. What now is the right thing to do given that the COP found Mr. Singh to have lied? What now is the right thing to do if you are not convinced by the COP report but you accept that Mr. Singh may have lied? Mr. Speaker, in both cases, I believe the right thing to do is to support the motion for three reasons. First, we cannot normalize lying by politicians or even worse, reward it. This sorry saga has already eroded trust in our institution and only a clear and unambiguous resolution will restore trust in the political process. Second, we must consider the impact on the future of our parliamentary democracy. We would not accept such behavior among our own MPs or anyone else. We did not let the matter rest when there was a suspicion that Ms. Khan lied to the House. We must hold Mr. Singh to the same standard. In future, there will be mistakes, there will be transgressions. We must be able to deal with them and MPs must not think that they can get away with lying, deceiving Parliament and the public. They must come clean, apologize and face the consequences. As a House, we must maintain our standards and our moral imperative to do the right thing now and for the future. And thirdly, Mr. Singh, uh, Mr. thirdly, Mr. Speaker, the allegation that Mr. Singh planned and executed what sounds like a ruthless deception of his party, the public and parliament, under oath to the select committee, and then possibly through his own party card as under the bus when they exposed him, it cannot be left to fester unresolved, weakening trust in politics, politicians, and this institution. It must be dealt with unambiguously and, if necessary, by the courts with neither fear nor favour for the sake of our democratic institutions. Mr. Speaker, what we do now will set the tone and standards for our future. It will indeed impact upon our democracy and the strengthening of our institutions, but in the opposite way that many members in the media have described. To oppose the motions before us is to say that one values who a person is more than what they do, the very opposite of our ideals of meritocracy. To oppose the motion is to say that a politically useful outcome is more important than upholding values. To accept uh, the weakening of norms as an acceptable price to pay for political success, and I find this all unacceptable. To support the motion is to fight for a Singapore that is special, where politicians can be trusted and are expected to be honest, capable and upright. To support the motion is to fight for a Singapore where politicians do the right thing not the politically convenient thing. To support the motion is to believe in our values and our integrity. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I support the motion. Thank you.